Moweni, Dumelang, Sambonani, and welcome to the Avrik podcast, a podcast that aims to bring clarity to the concept of violence and its consequences in the lives of victims and survivor groups, as well as the perpetrators and their descendants. In this Masterclass episode, Professor Dennis Francis is in conversation with Professor Shirley Ann Tate, discussing decoloniality, intersectionality as a framework, and anti-racist interventions in higher education. Um, I got an email that said, uh, Shirley, you should really say something for 20 minutes and then Dennis will take it away from there with questions. So I'm going to uh, do that. I'm very obedient, he said. <laughs> um, so I'm very obedient, I'm going to do that. I'm going to just share a small part of something that I wrote recently um, that's going to be published in an edited volume by colleagues from the University of Alberta, Paulina Johnson, Shaista Patel, who's from the University of California, San Diego, and Alex Da Costa. And that, that volume is from people in my network that I've started as part of my Canada Research Chair, which is on decolonization and anti-racism in settler colonial states, of which South Africa is a part in the person of Professor Andrea Kiet from Nelson Mandela University. Um, and this book is going to be published by the University of Alberta Press uh, either this year or next year, certainly by spring next year. So it's, it's a long paper, so I'm only going to do a small part at the beginning and then a little bit at the end. Maybe the small part at the beginning you'll think, oh my God, she said a small part at the beginning. No, stop now. But I hope not, okay? I hope not. I hope it's not so bad. Um, but I need to give you a little bit of context as to why I wrote this paper. And also just, just to say that this is one part of my work on decolonization and anti-racism in universities. Is the other part is on like black bodies in enslavement and freedom. But okay, uh, so the, the long paper comes from a particular position of absolute exhaustion from the violence that we saw during Black Lives Matter, for example, within and outside of the university. Also, the discovery of unmarked graves in Alberta and Saskatchewan in in um, in Canada from former residential schools from 2021 until now. These events brought me, brought us, face to face with the horror of black and indigenous death on a virtual loop, unbridled white supremacy and indigenous black and people of color on freedom. We saw in 2020 to 2022 that indigenous black and people of color communities and their allies have to work against continuing violence, repression and death that go beyond the COVID-19 crisis that decimated our communities. Even living within this continual grief, doing nothing is not an option. The question that I was faced with at the time I wrote this paper last year was about what, what I could do as somebody who wants to develop what I'm beginning to call decolonial intersectional anti-racist interventions. And you might think to yourself, why did she put intersectional in there? It's because sometimes uh, people who do anti-racist work forget that if you say anti-racist, it must be intersectional. Also, people who do decolonial work also forget that if you say decolonial, it's intersectional. So I put it in there, you know, mindfully in a way, even though it makes it quite long. <laughs> I think those interventions are long overdue in universities. So, decolonial intersectional anti-racism requires a few things. It requires acknowledgement of white domination. It also requires um, acknowledgement of implication and complicity by white people, but also by black people and people of color and indigenous people as well in universities. So I was left with a particular question at this point in time after I, I kind of thought about that. Um, and that was about white feminist allyship. So the question for me at the point I was writing this paper was, can white feminist allyship be trusted to co-deliver decolonial intersectional anti-racist change? And what would this look like institutionally? And my other question, which emerged from that, and thinking about al white feminist allyship as something that can't work, that doesn't work and hasn't worked so far, and then trying to go from that to thinking about solidarity and what that might mean, is my question from all of that thinking was, can relational coalition pra praxis provide this much needed change? 
So in this paper, I draw on just a phrase, a very brief intersectional segment uh, to begin to look at the question of the impossibility of white feminist allyship. And then the larger paper, I move to then looking at extractivism in academia, because academia is still viewed in the, in the global north as white property. And I did that to differentiate between what Stuart Hall calls intellectual work, and I can tell you what he means about that if you want me to later. So the difference between intellectual work and rampant careerism. And then I look at relational coalition praxis as, as an alternative. So I'm going to look at the first part about the impossibility of white feminist allyship. And then I'm going to give you a little snippet at the end of relational coalition praxis as an alternative. So I'm going to start with a, a bit of a long quote. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a prepared academic. It's because I'm sick of PowerPoint presentations. <laughs> I can't stand them anymore. <laughs> so I'm going to read it to you, right? So I'm sorry about that. So it's, um, it's from an interview be between Sadia Hartman and Frank B. Wilderson III in 2003, Afro-pessimist uh, scholars from the United States. And they say this, which I found very illuminating at the time that I read it. The ally is not a stable category. There's a structural prohibition rather than merely a willful refusal against whites being the allies of blacks due to this. And it's due to this species division between what it means to be a subject and what it means to be an object that produces a structural antagonism. But everything in the Academy on Race works off a particular question. How do we help white allies? That's the question we always ask as anti-racists. Black academics assume that there is enough of a structural commonality between the black and white working class position to think about, you know, we're both exploited subjects, for them then to embark upon a political pedagogy that somehow help whites become aware of this commonality. White writers posit the presence of something they call white skin privilege and the possibility of giving that up as their gestures of being in solidarity with blacks. But what both gestures disavow is that subjects just can't make common cause with objects. They can only become objects through modalities of violence or through modalities of empathy. In other words, the essential essence of the white-black relation is that of the master-slave. And masters and slaves, even today, are never allies. Right? You can imagine when I read that, that really struck me to my very core. It's a very powerful, um, I think, debate between the two of them on the impossibility of um, white allyship. But then maybe solidarity might work, perhaps. And, and the brief intersectional segment I want to share with you is about, I don't know, maybe 10 words or less. <laughs> and, and these words were said to me as I was leaving uh, to go to Canada to take up my Canada research chair position. Um, and, and these are, sorry you are leaving, but it opens up opportunities for me. These words spoken to me by a self-recognized, anti-racist, self-described white feminist ally have remained with me for years. Notice I said she's a self-recognized, anti-racist and a self-described white feminist ally. I remain flabbergasted by these words. And that's the reason I wrote this paper. I do things like that. I, you know, find words and I write something about them. I know it's a bit obsessive, but anyway. I'm still trying to work them out as I feel my way through fathoming what they meant to me at the time as this white woman's colleague and what they mean to me now in hindsight, remembering that there's a structural prohibition rather than merely a willful refusal against white people being the allies of black people. What does sorry from this white ally mean in juxtaposition with, but it opens up opportunities for me? I always take um, sentences very seriously because I'm still learning English. English is not my first language at all. So anything that comes after but to me has got to be a negation. So anyway, the sorry cannot be deeply felt if it is felt at all, because but as preface makes this a very British way of delivering something nasty some incivility that will stick in your throat, in your heart, in your mind for years, as indeed it did with me. That is the nature of this statement's vi violent psychic objectification, its 21st century reification of the master-slave relation. These white feminist allies' words were said with the absolute lack of hesitation and matter-of-factness that you get, you get from white supremacy. 
no thought given to how they would be received by me, how they would be felt, how they would linger in mind and affect. Those words made my intellectual labor, my body, my politics, black objects of value. I felt almost like a pieza, that Portuguese slave trading term used to calculate all bodily value through the unit of the 25-year-old enslaved man, so that, for example, two children would be one pieza, four older adults would be one pieza. Her words opened up plantation relationalities of violence and extractivism in 21st century predominantly white university spaces as we get in the UK. I had done hard decolonial intersectional anti-racist affective and intellectual labor so she would reap the benefit. As a white feminist ally, how could one want to appropriate so much to not mean the sorry? There's no sorry when all you see is benefit from the gap left behind institutionally because white feminist career trumps allyship in the structural antagonism of institutional racism premised on black social and epistemic death. Of course, the naked truth remains. Anti-racism is not about love. Racism is not about hate. What we have instead in 21st century life is the popularity and consumerability of certain representations of black life within an economic and cultural system founded in and still grounded in black social death. Sorry you are leaving, but it opens up opportunities for me. Wings interview the economic, cultural, political, and affective system. In other words, what Frank B. Wilson calls a racial libidinal economy of aversion and avid consumption within a prevailing anti-black structure of feeling, which we get in Western hemispheric life. In this structure of feeling, racialized others, me, become objects through modalities of violence or through modalities of empathy. The white feminist allies' violence empathy objectifies, operating through what Jose Medina calls meta-blindness and emotional numbness caused by the excesses of white epistemic authority and privilege. White meta-blindness and emotional numbness entails that empathic attachment is impossible with that already foreclosed as other, subaltern, subalternized, silenced objected. The anti-black structure of feeling set in train by white allyship in academia coexists with racist contempt. And this reminds me of Sylvia Winter's work um, in a very famous paper from 1992. I should say Sylvia Winter is um, a Jamaican-American critical theory person or cultural critic. Yeah, um, She spoke about no humans involved to talk about what she calls the terrorizing state apparatus of U.S. policing, governing surveillance and incarceration of black bodies. We can think about that in terms of academic life, in terms of the social life produced by racist contempt within academia, where no human in involved is repeatedly invoked as black bodies are ruled out of place, as Nirmar Pua would say. Black originated theories erased, and black contributions co-opted by white people so that black input ceases to be acknowledged. This appropriative version of white feminist allyship focuses on a shallow conception of racism as embedded in individuals. So if one feels themselves to be not racist, one is not part of the systemic racism of which co-optation and erasure are a part. Indeed, one would refuse to recognize these practices of extractivism as indeed this white feminist so-called ally did. <sighs> it's sad, isn't it? I keep thinking this is very sad. Anyway, yeah. if you think about contempt, of course, contempt is about negation. And these negations, like despising somebody, treating somebody as vile or worthless, scorning them, deriding them, indicate that anti-black hate is active very active, but is sublimated in institutions because of 21st century discourses of tolerant and equitable civility. Um, we're still left with contempt, though, going from the individual to, to, the, to the group and, and back again. And it's about 
either strong aversion or intense withdrawal, say, or um, attendant um, ignoring, I would say. All right, I'm trying to cut it short. Contempt can also be passive or it can be very active, but whatever, whatever it is, contempt and hatred, as we know, are not mutually exclusive and we can move rapidly between them. Anti-black racism's contempt means that the white feminist anti-racist ally would never give me or any other black academic the respect she or I am owed and the deference and trust that properly express that respect. Those who harbor race-based contempt, like she did, events, events superbia. They see themselves as having comparative high status in virtue of their race alone. They, they, they desire that status to be recognized, and they often attempt to exact esteem and deference from others by dishonoring members of the despised race. So you are leaving, but it opens up opportunities for me. Dishonored me, even as she spoke, expecting me to share her perception of her superbia, her extractivism through her career, careerist possession of my work. I'm going to stop at Dennis. I think he's making me quite sad. I don't know why that is. Mm. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll stop. So thank you, Professor Shirley and Tate. And I, I want us to, to just pause for a minute. And with that introduction, is that a common phrase at this university where we have professor followed by a woman or a woman of color? Many of our undergraduate students would go through a whole BA degree not having been taught by the largest demographic in this country. And it is a loss for us to recognize that. So let us, let us welcome you, Professor Shirley Ann Tate. And welcome to Salem Walsh University and to the Center for the Study of Afterlife of Violence and Reparative Quest. Thank you, Professor Pumla Kaboda Medikizela and colleagues in the Center for including me in this conversation. I, I know I couldn't make it in the day that it was meant to be, and I wrote to Professor Pumla and said, I would love to be there. Can we change the date? Oh, it was you, was it? Yes. <laughs> and it was so gracious. Thank you. Thank you that, that, that I could be here and to share this space with you. It is indeed a delight to share this space with you, Professor Ted. And so the questions I have today are not, not really questions, they're more conversation pieces. And I'm hoping that the audience will be interlocutors to this conversation too, because a lot of the work I do think, um, I think, I think this, the timing of your visit is a particularly um, significant one, because we are pretty much in the eye of the storm. We've just come out of a reeling, not just a COVID experience, but a reeling experiences of race and other oppressions at this university with a major revelation through the Compaper report. So the visit is opportune, and we're going to use this time to maybe to open up that conversation, which I think would be relevant for us. But let me start with this. Because I know, and many people wrote to me on, on Facebook and Instagram and by email to say, oh, we all want to be there, but the, the online is now closed. What do we do? <laughs> and, and some of them confessed to being, you know, in an out of themselves. I'm a closet follower. Or, you know, so, you know, some kind of people with diehard fans yeah. of you. So, so those who are listening um, to the recording, I've mentioned you. <laughs> I've outed you as well. But because most of those who are present here today and online are graduate students, many of them are our next generation of professors and black women professors too, and many diehard fans of your work, I wonder if we can start our conversation by telling us how you came to this work, although I believe sometimes the work finds us. Yes. How you came to this work as professor of race and education also a first appointment of its kind in the UK. And to preface that, just before uh, we, we, you introduced Professor Tate, we were speaking about South Africa, and the whole of the African continent actually doesn't have a professor of race. We don't have a centre for race studies. Despite coming from our notorious past, where race and racism is featured 
so productively and unproductively in our lives. So how did you come to this work? <laughs> um, okay, I, I suppose I should start at the beginning with myself a little bit. Sorry for revealing so much about myself, but you can find it online. Somebody told me I've got a Wikipedia page, so some of this is there. I've not read it myself. <laughs> yeah, um, so I'm a Jamaican, as you heard before. Um, born and brought up in Jamaica, then I went to the UK. And I have to say, you know, Jamaica was a post-colonial society then. Um, uh, but I never really understood I read Franz Fanon's very very good book Black Scene White Masters of course but that was about the colonial psyche so more about me my family the nation that was Jamaica at the time but I never understood what Fanon talked about about becoming black in the gaze of the white man until I went to the UK I just never did I was black I knew that we were all black in Jamaica. My family was black. I was brought up as black, proudly so. But I never understood that black-white relation until I went to the UK, right? So that's kind of the beginning for me of how I got into this work. I did my um, undergraduate degree in education. And one of the things that struck me was how it was that in every sociology textbook I read, in every book on education I read, it was about black people that were, it, it was just total pathology. You know, we were ineducable, we were criminals, we were unemployable, we couldn't speak English properly. You know, all of the kind of stereotypes that existed in British society were in the textbooks. And that, of course, enraged me, as you can imagine. So that was my early start. Um, it took me a while to become an academic, and I'm, I'm kind of one of those accidental academics. I'd never thought about it at all as something to do, but I became an academic as a job, <laughs> basically. Um, and also because I thought that there was a lot of work to do, um, especially when it came to righting the wrong. So basically, I wasn't on like a, a solo mission or anything like that, don't get me wrong, but I, I thought that there was a lot of like knowledge reparations to do, especially for black communities and black students that I would have in my classroom, since I never had that opportunity. And if I had not been born, brought up and, and been educated up to A-levels in Jamaica, I would have been a different person, I'm sure, because being in the UK impacts you in an incredible way as a person of color and a black person. You know, it's like you're, you're kind of, I think, you're... It, it impacts your whole psyche. I don't need to tell you because you'll, you'll know exactly what I mean. Okay. Um, for example, I could have decided at one point never to do my PhD. Um, so I got a first class honors for my bachelor's in education. Then I got a distinction for my master's, which is pretty good going, right? Um, and then I decided I didn't want to do linguistics anymore, so let me, um, let me think what else I'd do. So I decided, okay, I'll go into sociology a bit, do sociolinguistics more. And that's when I met someone who could have been the biggest block in my life ever, because he said to me, I don't think, I don't, you, you should just finish at MPhil. Don't even think about transferring to a PhD because you're too stupid to do one. Yeah. Um, and that enraged me too, seriously, because I thought, I thought how, can you, how can you go from a first and a distinction to being told you're stupid? It doesn't make sense. A white man, of course. So I decided, no, this isn't right. I'm going to apply for a scholarship. So I applied for a scholarship. We got one, of course, from the SRC. Um, how many people get an SRC scholarship in the UK? As really when I got it. Not many, I was told at the time. But I got one. Yeah, but I got one. Yeah, exactly. So I think I did pretty well, did my PhD in, and then left. And um, so being an academic, of course, in the UK, much like here I would expect as a black woman, is like a hard road to travel, a hard road to travel. Um, it took me many, many years to be promoted to associate professor or reader. In fact, when I applied to be a reader the first time um, in one university, I was asked, do you know what you're applying for because your CV just isn't up to it? 
you need to become more international, yet I was the most international person in my department. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the usual, the usual thing, there's always something wrong with what you have. It's never quite up to it, right? And, um, yeah, so countless experiences of violence and harm, I have to say, um, which led me to be part of a, a co-counseling group um, of other black women who just needed it. We just needed to talk about what we were experiencing, you know, the pain of it and stuff. And, um, and then by about 2010, I suddenly thought, I've had enough of this now, I have to say something. Because it wasn't just me going through this, a lot of women that I spoke to were going through the same thing. But it was kind of this like, secret that everybody kept the lid on, <laughs> you know, because you have to maintain this stability thing. You know, you can't, you can't say anything negative about the institution. You can't talk about your colleagues, whatever, right? You should just like grin and bear it, bite your lip, you know, the stiff British upper lip business. Anyway, whatever that is. <laughs> I don't want one of those. <laughs> and, um, and so I thought, no, I have, to, I have to really begin to speak about this, if not for me, of course, but also for other people. And um, so I thought, OK, I'm not going to get promoted at all. So I'm going to start doing this work on racism in universities in, in the UK. And um, the first time I actually spoke about this was in 2010 when I was invited to Brazil by the Black Brazilian Researchers Association to give like two, two talks. And, and one of them was like a keynote to the association itself on, you know, what, what academic life was like for black people in the UK. And that was the first time I ever spoke about this to a group of people. And I don't know, maybe there were maybe 200, 150, 200 people in the room and the room was totally silent. And I knew it was because they knew exactly what I was talking about because they had experienced it themselves. So that for me was a, a really great moment of like having validation from outside my institution um, and by a group of people I didn't know at all. Right. So, so I thought, OK. And afterwards, a lot of people came up to me and they said, you know, like, we really felt that sister. And the minute they said, we really felt that sister, I thought, yeah, no, no more needs to be said. Yeah. So then I started, you know, writing about this more and um, speaking about it too within the UK and elsewhere. And um, one, of my, one of my friends was very gracious, said to me, I think you started a bit of a mini revolution here, <laughs> Shirley, right? <laughs> Nobody else has done this. And, and now lots of people are beginning to talk about it. So you've enabled a lot of people to talk about this. So, yeah, and that's why I came to this part of my work, of course. Um, I'm not saying it's a, it's a beloved part of my work, because it's, it's, it's also a very difficult part of my work, I think. As I said to you, I can't, do, I can't talk about this anymore because it's making me sad, because it does make me sad to talk about the impossibility of something when I want to only think about the possible, because I'm a very optimistic person. But I think at the same time as being optimistic, we have to be also pragmatic. We have to know what might work and what's not going to work at all. And we have to start over rather than trying to make something work that won't. Um, oh, there's, there's so many resonance with our own work. There's just so many resonance with experiences here and uh, what, what happens. You know, you talk about this, this stiff, British stiff upper lip. Yeah. And I wonder what we would call that here. But I'm going to come to that as well. But in 2022, last year, we had a we had racist incidents at our Stellenbosch University. And, and most people isolated as we had some critical racism, but we have structural racism happens every day. Mm. We bump and grind into that every day. But a lot of these instances, when they come, they're usually qualitative evidence. So in other words, when there's a video, mm. so the University of the Free State, there was a video. Yes, we had a video here last year. And that's when there's qualitative evidence. That's when actions happened. So we don't know of all the other instances that have happened, that there've just been no videos, yeah. right? And in May, a white male student was caught on camera urinating on a first year African student's desk, laptop and books at one of our residences. It was a hard moment for many students, including ourselves. While urinating at the black student's belonging, he apparently says, this is how we treat black boys here. In October, another resident student relieved himself inside of the room of two fellow students. 
These incidents unleashed an outcry from students calling for an end to racism and harassment and the university reigniting conversations about Stellenbosch University's racist legacy and much media coverage. And interestingly, the media coverage wasn't all condemning the incident, right? So Professor Tate, I, I want to go back to 2017 when you, when you produced a special issue, and I want to flag that special issue because I think it was global, where people were talking about what was happening at their institutions and very similar stories in that special issue. But you brought that special issue together. And I wonder if you could share some broad thoughts on your learnings of that special issue, just broadly, and just your broad experience as professor in, of race and education. Mm, yeah, that special issue um, came out of a, a conference that I organized in Leeds when I was the director of the Center for um, Ethnicity and Racism Studies at Leeds University. <laughs> And um, it was building on my late colleague's work, uh, Professor Ian Law, who died last year as well, because he, he, he'd worked um, quite extensively, well, not extensively, but he'd worked quite a bit on, on racism in universities as well and produced like um, an anti-racist checklist for universities, which was up on the centre website at the time for anyone to read. Um, and for me, what, what came out of that conference for me was how anti-blackness is such a global experience. And that's what I hope is there in the special issue as well, that feeling that it's a global experience. It doesn't just belong to those of us in, in the Western Hemisphere who are like descendants of enslaved people. It's a global thing. Um, and that to me is like really worrying, especially since I think we're still in, in, the, in the decade for people of African descent, aren't we? I think we're, we're still in that. But interesting about that as well is that no university in the UK has spoken about that as something that we need to work on. No university in the UK, I don't know if here they have, I don't know, but no university in the UK or Canada for that matter has said this is what we're going to do for the decade. Nobody. It's like just being completely silenced. It's like how they silent, well the UK is master at silencing. Um, silence discussions about colonialism and continuing coloniality. Silence discussions about white supremacy. Silence any notion that there's racism on campuses, for example. So, um, yeah, I think um, that was the, the, learning, the learning experience for me, anti-blackness, global. And that came out as well in um, um, BLM, um, in 2020, didn't it, right? Because of the global, like, reach of, of, that, of that particular moment, yeah. And, you know, um, even in sad events like that, which just made me cry every day, watching the marches at, in different parts of the United States and the world, really, it kind of also gave me a feeling that, that you know, we've moved a long way, actually, even though it feels like we've gone back, like, millennia, you know, we've still moved a long way in terms of um, anti-racism globally, and I want to keep seeing that going forward. That has also been done, of course, by our, our predecessors. For example, I did not know until quite recently when a book called Pacifica Black came out that um, Marcus Garvey's United Nation, um, United Negro Improvement Association, Marcus Garvey, Jamaican, United Negro um, uh, Improvement Association had chapters in Australia. I didn't know that. So there were um, Indigenous Australians, part of the UNIA, sending regular newsletters, you know, contributions to the newsletter, all of that stuff. That was amazing for me to, to realize. So I think we've, we've, we've got like anti-racist activism, which existed for a long time, and we keep drawing on that. We see that in moments. Mm. So for me, that was an important issue to get out in the UK as well, because it had quite a few um, UK contributors in there who talked about um, how really awful the UK system is, not just for academics, but also for students and the sorts of things that our students have to endure, actually. Um, people uh, spoke about, for example, the impossibility of having a discussion about racism in the classroom, even though they could see racism actively in front of them, you know, in terms of anti-blackness, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, 
right? People also spoke about the fact that our universities consistently uh, fail uh, black students and students of color. Uh, um, black students and students of color start at universities, say they have like A star um, in their A levels. And then by the end of their three year program, they come out with a third class degree. I mean, I worry for my grandson. He's, he's just started university in September and you know, he got four A stars, right, for A levels, which is stellar. And I just keep thinking, oh, my God, what's going to... And he's actually at the university that I used to be at before Leeds University, so I know exactly where he is. And I just, I just think I hope he manages to get a first because that's what he deserves because he will work very hard as well. Anyway, so, so it was important for me to actually get that issue out because it also spoke to globality, to continuing coloniality and to the importance of keeping the work going. It had people in there who wanted to continue to build on, on the, the political engagements in their different contexts as well. So my time is up oh, no. with, with there, but with, with there are questions there, but I'm gonna steal one privilege, you know, you know I'm gonna talk about racial privilege, but I'm gonna steal privilege of the chair today. And it's, it's an important question. And it's an important question because I think it's something for us as a university community at Cinebosch needs to think about. And so we've had the Compepe report. And this is my question Then I'm going to hand over to, to the audience. After the release of the Compepe report, our institutions have made a couple of performative policy commitments. We know that transformation policies can easily become proof that transformation is taking place. In reality, little of the policy is meaningfully implemented and sometimes even resisted in some faculties or the micro levels of our institutions. And that's what is happening, right? I wonder if you could share some of your thoughts of how these processes can become mandatory tick boxes versus how we are intentional in changing self, institution, and society. Sorry. Yeah, um, thanks Dennis for that question. I mean, I, th I think that is the task, isn't it? That is the task and anybody who's done anti-racist work knows that that's the task. Um, and that's why I kind of started this work as well because for me, I was interested in the micro practices of racism. That's contained in just a phrase like that, right? Um, because I think that I think that people don't pay enough attention to these small things. And I'm not going to call them microaggressions. I know people call them microaggressions because I don't see aggressions as being micro in any way. They're always macro because of the way they impact you and others, right? Because even if for you at the time you didn't feel so bad, there might be people listening who, you know, it's a vicarious thing. They feel really bad. Um, I think, though, that... Um, it's hard. It's hard work, isn't it? It's hard work because what you've got to do is you've got to look at yourself. And looking at yourself is something that's very, very difficult. That's why I hope that my work kind of holds a mirror. And then, you know, not to say you did this, but to say this is something that you might have done to somebody and you never thought about it at the time, but this is the impact it had. So maybe think about this. Um, you have to think about yourself, you have to acknowledge complicity. Right. And like we're all complicit in racism, just because I'm black doesn't mean I'm not complicit in racism at any point. No, that doesn't that doesn't give me like a get out of jail free card at all. Um, we always have to be like really aware, I think, of ourselves and our, the roles that we play in keeping um, institutions going rather than in transforming them. Now, I think what that means is. Um, we have to think about what we would gain and what we would lose because we're people and we've got to pay our mortgages, we've got to raise our kids, we've got to buy some shoes and we've got to eat okay, right? So we've got to think about how can I keep my job at the same time as do this political work that I know is necessary to do? So I'm not saying sacrifice yourself. <laughs> I would never say that. But know that if you do uh, these sorts of political work, and it's the same if you do like queer activism, if you do uh, disability activism, you know, if you do any kind of work that can be seen as activist, even if you don't call it that yourself, because I've never called myself that, but people see my work as activist work, right? You know that it will impact your career. I'm being honest with you because you are the future of our profession, right? It will impact your career. So then you have to think about what will you do when your career stalls? 
What I did when my career was stalling in the UK was to get a job in South Africa. And then after I got a job in South Africa, University of the Free State, I was coming to be in sociology <laughs> as the head of department. But after I got that job, I got another one in the UK. So I took the UK one so I didn't have to move, right? Yeah. So be prepared for your, your career stalling. Be prepared for having a lot of negative interactions with colleagues and also superiors where you work. That's, that's a given. Be prepared to also be extremely lonely where you are because a lot of people, irrespective of whether they're black or not, won't want to associate with you because, you know, you know, bad stuff rubs off. Yeah. And, and you know, we, we have this saying in the UK, you know, one black person is okay, two black people constitutes a riot. There's also a lot <laughs> part, right? So people kind of ignore you when they see you and don't even say hello, even though they know you are and they know you're, where your office is. They never ask you to have coffee with them. Guilty by association, right? So, I, but I think, I think for me, um, it, was a, it was a matter of I couldn't stay silent any longer. I had to save myself. I really did. And that was my way of saving myself. <laughs> We seem to have helped a few people along the way, so I'm very happy about that as well. Um, and I also felt, um, I th no, I felt uh, both a responsibility and an obligation to um, students, both black and white and of color in the room, in the rooms that I taught in, um, to produce another learning experience for them. Uh, also to give them access to a, a different curriculum from the normal white dead men that you get in sociology because it was all Marx Weber Durkheim. Um, and still it continues to be Marx mm. Weber Durkheim, right? In Canada now, I've got students teaching, I teach my MA class to students from all over the university because they're not just sociologists. And they say to me, this is the first time they've been taught by a black professor a black woman, this is the first time also that they've ever read anything written by black people. How is that possible? I ask you, how is that possible? So um, I continue to take the responsibility I have seriously um, for knowledge reparations and also for ensuring that none of my students ever have to put up with what I was told is too stupid to do a PhD. <laughs> I'll just stop there. So we're going to take a round of three questions and then we'll give Professor Tate a chance to respond to that. Then we'll have a conversation question. We'll go for another three questions. Will that be okay? Yeah. Great. Okay, my name is Ayan Danyoka. I'm here with the center. I'm a friend of the center, former student here. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this conversation. So I just wanted to ask Professor, how do we apply an intersectional lens that does not sort of undermine our efforts to disrupt racism? Uh, when I was reading for my master's, I sort of went into this literature around intersectionality. And what I did sense that there was a lot of frustration from scholars who are within the anti-racism kind of um, domain with intersectionality. You know, you probably know more about that. You know, the, the sense that, you know, it just kind of buries, you know, our focus on race and takes us into all kinds of directions. And I also experienced that in the work that I also do in the world, where I was at one point invited in, a, in an intervention around racism. So the issue was actually, it started with race. And as I began to engage with this project team that was working on this, they wanted to apply an intersectional lens to this situation. But as the conversation unfolded, by the end of the of the conversation, I could not find race in the conversation, you know, because there had been this, you know, intersectional focus. It moved us into all kinds of direction, and I was very concerned. Also, given the fact that you know you've spoken to these issues, that race becomes this big white elephant in the room that we're also afraid to speak about. So sometimes it does feel like if if, if we apply this intersectional lens, we lose the focus. So I'd like to hear a bit more about how you think we can effectively apply intersectional lens. Thank you. Uh, where were you when you were having this conversation? Because it sounds like a very European one, I have to say, right? Because like um, in, in like, I think all of, Europe, the, all of Europe that I know anyway, intersectionality has been taken up by like um, women's and gender studies, for example. And 
everything in it to do with anti-racism or with black life, with black women's lives specifically, has been removed. It's been erased. To me, there's, 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 there's like a connection between intersectionality and anti-racism. But I don't see them as two separate things mm -hmm. at all. I see them as very connected. I can't think one without the other. And the reason I can't think one without the other is that intersectionality actually comes out of black feminist organizing, black feminist theory, right, from the United States, Kimberly Crenshaw, as we know. It comes out of a very specific kind of black feminist history. So, and anti-racist history too, I have to say. So for me, they're connected. So it interests me about like where you were having that conversation. Was it here? Because you know what, why I asked you, was it here? Because that reminds me very much of Trump's United States, where you can't say intersectionality anymore. Still now, you can't say it, right? In the UK, the same thing. You know, the culture wars are based around no critical race theory and no critical race studies in universities. No talk of intersectionality it must be removed from the curriculum. And also, yeah, it's true. It's unbelievable, right? Unbelievable. You just think, why? This is ideas that black people thought of. It's so revolutionary that it has to be removed. Why is it revolutionary? Because it, it actually gets to the heart of white supremacy. That's why. Because critical race theory is focused on black people. The other focus of critical race theory, of course, is that racism is here, it's never left. So, you know, in the UK, we have this thing now where under the conservatives, <laughs> they had this really terrible investigation um, in which it was found that there was no racism in the UK whatsoever. See, Azrini is laughing here, right? Because she knows that one. No racism in the UK whatsoever. The UK was the most equal society in the world. And like all the black people were in the UK were doing great, you know, as, as black people and people of color in a, in a white majority state, the UK was leading the world, right? That is, what, that is how the UK sees itself. Yet, just last week, there was a report about black deaths in police custody. That's a long standing thing in the UK. And we won't talk about other forms of incarceration like being put into mental health institutions, for example, you know. And the fate of black kids in schools were just like, like just thrown out of schools even before they, they graduate and put into special units. That yeah. still happens all the time. So for me, I don't, I don't see this a disconnect at all between intersectionality and anti-racism. I would say to anti-racists, you have to really watch yourself when you, when you think that it's not, there's no connection. And for all those people who think intersectionality is the only thing to think about, remember it's history. Remember where it comes from. It was not a white invention, basically. So if it's not a white invention, it's got to have racism and anti an understanding of racism and how it operates and anti-racism as an integral part of it. Because if you think about what intersectionality is, it's a methodology, it's a heuristic, it's a way of seeing the world. It's about putting black women at the center of theorizing. So I stopped, sorry. I kind of went on a bit there. Thank you so much for today's masterclass. Um, it feels less of a hierarchical top-down discussion, I, and I really feel safe enough to kind of bring up the questions that are coming to my mind. Um, what I wanted to kind of understand or know in your process as you've been an academic is the question of audacity and, and having the audacity to translate the inner workings that you're having with your own identity into the work that you do um, and, and how you deal with the isolation of that. Um, because it's one thing to talk about it, we can understand and relate to it um, by virtue of being in an institution. But particularly as a Black woman, I, I know for myself, I've, I've really struggled to come to terms that um, a lot of the practice of what you do as a young activist and these radical statements that you make and, 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 and this idealized solidarity that you have now has to form in a way where it is aligned paragraph, size 12, Times New Roman, justified, Harvard referencing, um, with right grammatical, no type, you know, typo, typographical errors and things like that. And, and the violence of that experience, I think, is something that uh, I'm struggling with. And I know that a lot of my other um, friends that are doing their postgraduate studies are struggling with. So, yeah, if you could maybe illuminate sort of how, how you deal with that juxtap that very jarring juxtaposition 
um, whether that's in your intimate spaces or um, just practices that you that you keep and evolve um, and how you're vigilant with it because it's very easy to sort of be dragged down and bogged by it so yeah that's that's kind of what's been on my mind so thank you thank you for your question I like what you say about audacity um, I think I think that's a, a really nice word but I would have I would for myself um, what kind of impelled me to do this work was fear that I was going to lose myself within white supremacist institutions and just become somebody who just succumbed to it all, you know, um, and accepted my position. So, but thank you for calling it audacity. I never thought about it in that way before, really. But I suppose it, maybe people reading it as audacity was why I got the incredible backlash I, that I got. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, thank you. Um, I know exactly what you mean about the activist part and then the other part that needs to do all this incredible academic work. What I want you to do, though, my sister, is not to think of them as separate, but think of them as being part of you. You, that is who you are, right? You can't separate yourself out. Um, so, yeah, we have to learn the craft. We have to learn the craft of academic writing. And I'm still learning it. As I said to you at the beginning, no word of a lie, I'm still learning English. I learn new words every day um, and new ways of phrasing things. And as you craft yourself as a writer, you can put yourself more into what you write, which is what I learned in my academic journey. Because as you kind of become a more established academic, people ask you to write things then, don't they? And you can write exactly what you want and how you want to write it, which is a great liberation, I have to say. Um, it might always be published. <laughs> so you have to kind of, you know, think about that as a possibility. I'll give you an example. Uh, very early on in my career, I, I wanted to publish something in a journal. And I'd done my research on, like, um, black British people on identities, right? And um, I... I transcribe what they said to me in exactly the way they spoke it because I'm, I'm a, a conversation analyst at heart, really. And the journal sent it back to say, we cannot, we cannot publish this because you're reproducing black people as idiots. <laughs> and I wrote back and I said, no, I'm actually doing it, writing it as they spoke. And they would approve of this because we don't speak standard British English. They still didn't publish it. Just as an example. Uh, so rather than changing it all to standard English, I just didn't publish it. So that things like that can also happen. But I would encourage you to also find other forms of writing that might appeal to you, like if you're a blogger, some people are bloggers, or other, other means of, of spreading what you want to spread. So you might want to do podcasts. Other people do that, and they really love that, that kind of way of doing activist academic work. Um, but don't, as I said before, don't see one as separate from the other. That's, that's a bit like saying, are you black or a woman today, Shirley? Which I also wrote about in another one of these papers, because that was a question I was asked once. So it's just you, authentically you as well. Let me, let me slip in a question here whilst we... we um, um, we, we, are, we are on a close theme. Sarah Ahmed, in her book, writes about being a feminist killjoy. Oh, yeah. And she talks, and it's a, it's a powerful metaphor of, of, of disrupting a moment yeah. and, and, and killing the moment or killing the joy of the moment. And so often that joy is oppressive, right? When people raise awareness of consciousness on issues of sexism. I want to bring it back to what it means to be people of color taking responsibility within this university. And so to keep the peace and collegiality in our departments and staff gatherings, we too are sometimes complicit with racism, racist jokes, because we are afraid of being perceived as disruptive, troublesome, or to paraphrase Ahmed, to be killjoys. What are your thoughts of how we could be firm in our stance as feminist, queer, or anti-racist activist? In other words, how can we be consistent at, as killjoys, 
disrupting oppression in whatever form and shape at Selimash. I think I think what you've just said is really important, disrupting oppression in whatever form it takes. Um, because one of, one of the things about this long paper is that I talk about the need to develop relational coalition praxis out of the solidarities that we need to have, broad cross-section. That came out of like maybe um, BLM, for example, we saw that broad uh, coalition developing. Um, we can't engage in like single issue politics at all. It just doesn't work. And we've seen that it does not work. Um, we have to make space for everyone in struggle going forward, I would say, because white supremacy takes no prisoners of any sort, actually, right? Yeah. Um, I think one of the things is, though, um, that we have to think about is, is younger colleagues, junior professional colleagues of ours. I can, I can kind of say what I want to say um, because I'm a senior colleague, right? So I can say stuff. It's my responsibility, therefore, to say stuff rather than not saying anything, remaining silent and, you know, uh, reaping the benefits of that silence. Say. Um, we have to think of what we need to do in terms of building solidarities within universities as well. But of course, that's, it's always um, kind of problematic in a way. To, it's not easy to do that because like, uh, as the late Charles, Jamaican philosopher Charles Mills said, um, you know, we live within the racial contract. And it's not just white people who gain from that racial contract. Also, black people, people of color, also complicit. We sign that racial contract, which means that we will not bite the hand that feeds us, basically, because we get something from that as well. So, like I said before, it's for people to kind of weigh up. What will I lose? But actually, no. What will I gain from continuing being complicit? What will I gain? Because there's a certain point beyond which complicity does not work. Why? Because we know we exist in institutions in which there is a white network, not just men, women too, not just straight squares as well, not just working class, but any class, right? Um, where there is a white network that closes itself off from any other people. So we might gain to a point, right? So when you see that happen to you, you know, why am I being complicit? I wasn't being complicit, by the way, but why am I being complicit? Why am I buying into this institution? Because it is not a meritocracy. It certainly is not a meritocracy. In the UK, what, what gives you something is actually being white. What gives you something more is being a white, straight, upper class or middle class man who went to Oxford or Cambridge. That's the truth of it. That's what gives you something. You don't get much if you're not that kind of a person. That's so institutions like universities were built for. They were built for national citizens who fit that description. So we will never get anything. So I think what we have to remember, well, in my view, in my opinion, you might find it a bit jaded. You might think, oh, Shelley's got a really bad problem here. But anyway, um, in my view, I've always been an outsider within institutions, and I will always continue to be that simply because of the body I inhabit. Not because I'm not, you know, not because I'm valueless. I don't feel valueless in any way. Also not because I'm not intelligent enough or something, just because I'm a black woman. Yeah. I, I love the phrasing of, in our complicity, what do we lose rather than what do we gain? Because we actually don't gain, right? No, we don't yeah. gain anything. Oh, I love it. I would love to take another question. There's five minutes more. And then I have a burning question around the Compaper report and this push to ghettoize how we, how we address racism within this university. So, Thank you so much. It's a, <coughs> as a sort of contemporary, I connected close to you and it's in terms of experience. It's amazing how uh, transnational these experiences of blackness are. Um, really, we, we should we would have another longer conversation just sharing those experiences within the academy as senior black scholars with experiences of you don't just become a professor. You've got to fight for this. 
you know, you, you, you're not made one at the first application. There's mm-hmm. always like a, a hurdle. Yeah. Even at the institutions, as Dennis says, that are most liberal, the ones that the ones who are, in fact, like the woman who identify as anti-racist, mm-hmm. they, you know, even within those institutions. The uh, 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 provocate, or rather the, 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 the question or the point that I'm sort of pulling out of the conversation <coughs> has to do with the really wonderful expression that you gave about knowledge, knowledge reparations. Mm-hmm. I really love that. Mm-hmm. Um, knowledge reparation. And um, <coughs> I think, I mean, that sounds like something that could be an interesting <coughs> mantra you know, knowledge reparation, because it's, it's, it's almost like a, a call to action. Mm-hmm. And how that conversation around <laughs> reparation might inspire emerging scholars, you know, postgraduate students <coughs> to engage in, to pursue studies that really are about, you know, disrupting knowledge Mm -hmm. uh, in that way. So that it's it's a thoughtfulness that begins with where you are, you know, which in part is why we have in these masterclasses that, you know, uh, the greatest knowledge that's revolutionary is one that begins with, you know, um, Ijoma, the woman at the corner there, speaks about her own experience. And at a conference we had in December on um, experiences uh, within the Global South or transgenerational trauma in the Global mm-hmm. South, instead of a, a, she gave the kind of academic presentation, but she read a poem on her experiences. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because we had a conversation after that, that what would have been powerful would the, would have been a combination of the poetry reading and the scholarly work that yes. she was doing. Yes. We had a conversation with a friend and colleague, Tamak Gab, who was also a speaker at this event. And that really is what, you know, uh, uh, I'm hoping that can emerge from this conversation. How do we do knowledge reparation? Mm-hmm. How do we how do we have this conversation so that mm-hmm. emerging scholars, both black and white, mm-hmm. can engage with these questions because it is about disrupting um, the knowledge trends, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and introduce, reclaiming our right and our capacity to actually mm-hmm. engage at that level. Yes, yeah. And I mean, I think that one of the, the frightening thing that's happening now is there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a large European you know, a, a kind of movement to Africa uh, yeah. to engage you know, with these large scholarships that are available through the European Union. And how, how do we connect with these conversations in the global south, you know, so that the partnerships are about strengthening this idea of knowledge reparations through even what is being presented to us by the global north as the partnership PhD partnerships, rather than you know engaging questions that they are interested in to really define the trends, mm-hmm. almost like a new trend, almost like a new, yes, an emerging kind of new scholarship in the same way that you set the trend with your how do you do that in places such as these to set new trends? I know that you can't do it on our own. It's got to be in partnership with, you know, people who are already on the global stage. So I wonder whether you you have any thoughts on that. Um, I think one of the one of the big issues that thank you for. Um, Engaging with that concept as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's important for sure to do, to, to think about knowledge as, as something that we'd need to do repair on, actually, um, for everyone, as you said as well. I think one of the problems, though, in, um, in doing partnerships with universities in the global north, I'm just going to be very blunt here, is that, you know, they still engage in <coughs> colonial politics, unfortunately, right? So how do you influence? Um, that then in a way that takes it in the direction that you want 
is 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 a is a really big one. You know, when when they get like funding like from the EU of however many millions to do some research, unfortunately, what also funders like to see is some notion about you know they're coming to do development work to make to make us more European than we are at the moment, right? That's that's part of it. Unfortunately, I think that's still very much. <coughs> I still very much like, yeah, I think I think really that a lot of the funding bodies in the UK, which I know need to be decolonized in many, many ways, actually, and they need to begin to see that the the research that they fund, the concerns need to be from the people that are that are, they're going to get the data from rather than necessarily being from the researchers from the university or from, you know, the top down kind of a thing that we still have. And I would say the same for these partnerships as well. One of the things that always, it doesn't surprise me because I know it's, it's about colonial relationships, but one of the things that I always find interesting is how we still, I say we because I'm Jamaican, so I'm saying we, how we still send our PhD students to the UK to do their PhDs or send our MA students to the UK to do their PhDs when you know you're sending them to a, a country <laughs> in which they're going to suffer, in which they're not going to learn stuff that they couldn't learn here, for example, in a much better learning environment for them as people. So I think, for me, one of the big things that we have to do is to, like, decenter Europe, decenter Canada, decenter the United States, because they're not necessarily seats of learning for us as people. That's what I would say. I understand that they have a specific location in academic life. Like, you know, to say you're at a UK institution for many people would be to say you're at somewhere really good, right? Mm -hmm. Not even Oxford or Cambridge, just anywhere in the UK for some people is like, you know, you've, you've done something really great in your academic career. But then you go there, you go to LSC, which is supposed to be really good. You go to Oxford and Cambridge, which is supposed to be really good. And any black student will tell you that their life is awful because of what they have to live through as like the only black student in the class, for example, then they're the only international student in the class. And that's not anything new either. I mean, I, I was the only black international student in my class in my undergraduate. Then for my MA, I was the only black student <laughs> in the class. And for my PhD, I was the only black student too, my whole academic life. So that those kind of learning environments aren't really conducive to like well-being, I don't think. I think it's, um, it's a really important question, Pumla, as well, for universities to engage in here. Right? Your, your bigger question about how do, we, how do we get knowledge reparations and how do we influence what happens. Um, but I don't know if they want to do that. I have no idea if they would like to do that or see that it's, it's something that's necessary for them to be involved with, really. I don't know. It's not a very good answer to your question. It's because it's such a hard question. It's really, the point is uh, the role of the scholars themselves mm -hmm. that, you know, on the one hand, as you say, is this what the university wants? But on the other hand, I mean, the academy, one of the good things about it is that you can define your agenda. Mm -hmm. You know, and and uh, there's no one who's going to say you cannot supervise such and such a work, mm -hmm. especially because, you know, it's your scholarship. You uh, And if students can, then associate with that as well, mm -hmm. so that it's not from the position of, I'm afraid of doing this kind of work, but... Mm -hmm. I have the responsibility to do this kind of work mm -hmm. at this kind of institution. Yeah, yeah. yeah but it's, it's for people to take that responsibility right, too. That's right, the thing. That's, that's, that's the thing. And I mean, we can do it because we're senior colleagues, right? So we, we can take that responsibility. But as I said before, a lot of junior people would find it really hard, especially in some departments. So I, I want to bring the session to a close and to say thank you for attending, Professor. Thank you. This has been such a wonderful conversation today. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this podcast. For more, you can check out our website.